challenges with educational policy, particularly around literacy, is that because everyone knows how to read and write, everyone believes that they are an expert. If I were to characterize the work of the policy committee in um, an LRA, I would say that that's their job, to demystify it for the members so that they feel confident and competent to approach uh, legislators and their, their aides with their concerns and how to go about doing that. For me, as a literacy researcher, that my work has to in some way directly impact communities um, and that communities inform the work that I do. I think as literacy researchers and as teacher educators, um, it's really important for us to be prepared to respond to policy changes and to enact the types of policy that we think is important to help children succeed and become, you know, politically conscious and, and literate beings, you know. Viewing research and viewing inquiry as a human right that all people, you know, um, should have the opportunity to exercise, that all people should be able to um, generate knowledge and and collect data and um, make claims about issues that immediately impact themselves and immediately impact their own communities. Policy is a tool, and so that means it has enabling and constraining properties. And so we should be the ones that will help um, educate the communities and to put out our message in, in, in the public sphere. Someone's got to do that. Policies aren't neutral. There's always consequences because of that dual-sided nature of them. We have a responsibility at all levels, from the local grassroots, at the state level, at the federal level, to really be using what we know. My work is about um, partnering with immigrant communities to think about educational access and um, the resources of bilingual communities. And I think it's important to use that to highlight the strengths that's already in communities to diversify the research process so that it's more participatory. I hope that by looking closely through research at um, how those policies truly travel, um, across years in classrooms and in children's identities and experiences as learners. Um, I hope that that can start to make a difference in um, just how policies are interpreted um, at those larger levels. We've been trying to work very closely with our local school district to think about ways that we can support children who do not pass the assessment uh, that maybe are more productive than uh, retaining them in grade. If we can show that some of the efforts that we've made in the school district actually supports children's literacy growth, then I think the state will be more open to listening to, to what we have to say. The work of pre-service teacher education, which often gets denigrated in the hierarchy of elite academics and researchers and grant getting and graduate schools that don't do the dirty work of PRAC and of undergraduate teacher education, for me, reform, politics, cultural change happens in pre-service teacher education. My research has been around cultivating um, racial and linguistic diversity in teacher education, and part of that has been um, introducing more students of color to the field. And so for me, one of the direct ways has been to create pipeline um, initiatives for students in our K-12 school settings to be introduced to teaching my work is in Mississippi, where 52% of the students live in rural communities, and we are um, probably the neediest, um, the highest priority in terms of um, our rural students are also often low income and minority. Um, and the U.S. Department of Education often writes policies that don't work well in rural communities. With the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act, states are required to come up with state plans, um, and they can't get their Title I funding unless they write a state plan. And um, one of the components of state plans that's new this time around from No Child Left Behind is that states have to do, um, there's a lot more provisions around working with English language learners. I've always tried to do research that's very much 
dealing with the major problems that educators face. So whatever the policy situation regarding literacy, I'm always interested in the impact of that on teachers. And I'm also always interested in particular on the likely effects of policy on children who are growing up in high poverty situations. Literacy, which is um, very much an artifact of culture, right, is much more um, able to be leveraged in spaces where there is that mutual understanding. For me, it's a big part of, of advocating for immigrant students, immigrant scholars, and, and saying that, yes, you know, there is somebody who actually cares about what we go through and there's somebody who is going to move past that and try to influence administrators and curriculum so that we get a better, um, a better uh, experience for these, these individuals in the United States. The site stands for a critical, interactive, transparent, and evolving platform for the literature review. And the ITEL part stands for Initial Teacher Education and Literacy. So our goal is to gather together all of the studies that have been done, all the research studies that have been done that have focused on the preparation, the initial preparation of teachers in the area of literacy, uh, and to begin to build a synthesis of that literature. Um, present that synthesis, but continue to add to that synthesis. Part of what we hope we can do is be responsive immediately, so that if someone comes with an initiative that makes some claims about evidence, that we could immediately go to the literature and say, well, let's look at what evidence supports that. A number of years ago, I actually had a column in the LA Times around reading, uh, and, and the column was oriented to parents of English language learners. And so I could do kind of an evidence-based column but in a discourse and a genre that was totally accessible to people who read the newspaper. And millions of people read my column. Think about how many people read our articles. So that was a wonderful venue for um, really trying to leverage what I knew to audiences that really mattered to me. On first glance, children's literature um, experts really don't have much to say about policy. After all, you couldn't imagine two territories more distant than policy and kids' books, right? I see the children's media industry, which is a multinational entertain part of multinational entertainment corporations, as the Goliath that we have to battle against in order to get fair and equitable representation of kids um, like the kids we teach in our classrooms. In January 2016, I began the Healing Fictions Twitter account with my graduate students at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. Every day at noon, we tweet out a diverse book recommendation. I've been really involved in talking about problems and controversies in the conversation on diversity in children's literature. And what I wanted to do was to really also be part of the solutions. I also never turned down an invitation to write for one of the state journals, whether it's a special education journal or a um, school administrator journal. Another thing I try to do is participate in um, invitations from the state education department, whether it's work on standards committees or do teacher certification tests. I try to go, and so there's an opportunity to, to talk about what the research says in those kinds of settings. I was president of the New York State Reading Association, and so we had a tradition of every couple of years inviting um, the commissioner of education to come and give a talk. And so did that and then invited him to speak specifically with teacher education folks. Our challenge is how do we translate the research in ways that it can reach larger audiences, um, uh, make sure that it's in different languages, including Vietnamese, Indonesian, Spanish, English, and Tagalog. There's a Filipino community there as well. Um, and also that the research leads to direct recommendations, you know, for the school district, um, for their teachers, for policymakers, both um, in Philadelphia and beyond at the national level. 
I also try to use social media as much as possible. Um, so uh, Twitter in particular, I find to be an effective tool, um, whether, it's a, whether it's a chat with other professionals or um, our, I know our local school district does a number of Twitter chats. Um, they do a weekly literacy chat. And so I try to join them as often as possible to help when they have questions about their practice to help share what I know about the research to help them think about those questions that they have. The other thing that I think is incredibly important is to try to use different media. So for a long time um, I was working with colleagues to put together, um, I guess you'd call them educational documentaries. So to try and make complex ideas um, accessible. So to democratise research really, so that more and more people have access to ideas which are important and generative. Revising state policy, um, we um, have one that is very meaning-centred and you know, very much um, embedded in a, a cycle of you know, planning, implementing, um, reflecting and revising. <laughs> Larger policies are not enacted unilaterally, so there's local resistance to the ways that policies are enacted. There's also local governments, local schools, local school districts, particular principals, right? So we, um, how we interact with policy always happens on a local level, and the resistance also happens on a local level, but then multiple locals talking to one another, I think, can help. Um, fuel larger movements and that's why I also think education and educational research is important because there's a long history of this work of resistance. There's a long history that many of the communities that we work with, um, whether immigrant communities or communities from historically disenfranchised groups, have had to have been doing this work for a long time and I think we need to learn from our elders and local contexts, learn from histories of resistance that are already in community context to think about ways to move forward to impact um, the larger conversation. They were developing their own curriculum based on a knowledge base that they had about what teaching and learning was all about. Because I still hear people talking about what researchers do and what teachers do. And I see all teachers as capable of to being teacher researchers or being researchers and being teachers, however that manifests itself. I think it's one of those hard things about policy work, right? So you want to impact at a, bit, at a bigger level. You want to impact at the state or, or national level because you just want so much for strong practice to be happening across the board. But at the same time, you have schools right in your backyard uh, that, that you can support and help by being on the ground. and and. If we can start there, I feel like we've made a lot of progress. But reforms come and go. But what you find is they almost have like radioactive isotopes. They have a half-life in teachers and in schools. They have a half-life in, the, in, the, in our research community because people pick them up and they begin talking about them and suddenly they show up in Singapore or they show up in a whole other part of the world. They're retained in the system because they're retained in teachers' expertise and in teachers' memories and in teachers' bodies and in kids. Whether or not it means big policy change or it just sort of seeps into the consciousness, I think it can yield policy change because it reminds people that there's real kids and teachers out there who have to live with the rules that get made in other places. Communicating the research that drives our professional development and uh, to policymakers is tricky because they're not scholars, they're mostly regular people and they represent constituents who are regular people. And I ask myself, all right, if I had their values, how can I make a reasonable sounding argument from their values to the outcomes I want to achieve for the state and for literacy? And if you can do that, then they at least think you're making a reasonable argument, and so you have a conversation. That's, that doesn't mean you get everything you want, but that's a start. We're in an age of where facts don't matter, and information doesn't matter, and we have to get better at figuring out, okay, how do we become part of that space where facts, research, and evidence really become Im not just important, but fundamental to messages and policies that get out there. 
So for me, the important thing about conducting research is that it's an incredible privilege that we have to be doing that form of work and to take very seriously where we put our time and effort. So I would encourage young researchers to keep getting their hands dirty in the sense of keep working with teachers, with school principals, with parents, with children. I think that there's a lot of emphasis now on, um, on outputs and publications and that's all fine and good. But I think um, we still need research that uh, researchers that are in it for the long haul, that are interested in seeing what happens over time and in particular places. A lot of the communities that I'm working with can't necessarily trust or wait for people in power to create the policies that are going to protect them. So there has to be also policy generated at more local and community-based levels. Mm -hmm.